There is no other God beside Him. There is no other hope beside Him. There is no other eternity beside Him. And if you are not willing to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to have your faith rest in Yahweh, then He cannot grant you the eternity in His presence, but He will grant you an eternity apart from His presence. And He does not desire for you to spend an eternity apart from Him. He desires you to be with Him. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Yahweh wants a relationship with you if you will place your faith in Him. God has a name. And I want to help us to learn and understand that name today. If you'll go with me to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to dive in and I want to show you the first mention of God's name. A little background as we get into it. Uh, this is a, a moment where Moses was uh, an Israelite boy who was born uh, in Egypt. Pharaoh commanded that all the children, all the male Israelite boys were to be executed. His mother took him and hid him down by the river where Pharaoh's daughter found him, picked up little Moses, kept him, raised him in the palace until he was fully grown. After he was fully grown, Moses then ran away into the wilderness. God found him in the wilderness and began to confront him through a burning bush. This is the confrontation that we read in Exodus 3, verse 10 through 15. It says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou bringest forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of thy fathers have sent me unto you, they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt, thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. And begin, I'm excited to begin a sermon series with you. Now, I know that my sermon series is going to be a little bit different than pastors because I enjoy listening to pastor and he gets to be here. And when he's here, we're going to be able to enjoy him. Although I preach periodically and I get to enjoy the word of God with you periodically, those moments when in the future, whenever those moments arise, I will come back to this sermon series with you. I'm going to dive in and we're going to look at the seven I am statements of Jesus Christ. And we're going to unfold the seven I am's that Jesus had said while he was uh, here with us on earth. But I want to begin with this idea. God has a name. God's name is pivotal to the understanding of the seven I am statements that Jesus makes. It is pivotal based on God's name. Last time I was able to be with you and we were, I was preaching, I preached the value of a new name. We talked about the etymology of what names mean and how the definitions bring value to that name. We spoke about how uh, different names have, have come from different origins. We get our name from our parents. And our, the names that our parents give to us, they, maybe we get names from a, a loved one. Maybe we get a nickname based on a personality trait. We get a nickname based on a physical attribute. Maybe we get a nickname from a circumstance or a, 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 an inside joke. We have all sorts of names that, that we carry, labels we carry. But many of us, our name is chosen for us. And then throughout our life, we begin to develop the definition of that name. My little son is, is, is about four to five weeks old now. Don't tell my wife I can't figure out which. I, I, have to, I have to do the math. He's a young child and he has a name. We named him Theo and yet he doesn't have necessarily a reputation yet. He doesn't have a, a testimony yet. He, you don't know who he is just by knowing his name. You don't know anything about him because he has not developed that. The way that we have our name, we receive a name from our parents, maybe a nickname, maybe our given name. And through that name, 
We then, throughout our life, throughout our habits, throughout our choices, throughout our actions, throughout our words, we begin to develop a definition, a testimony, a reputation that when somebody else hears our name, they can, they can identify us in a nutshell. Oh, I know Caleb. He does this, he does that, he's this way, he's that way. Oh, oh, I know what he's like. Oh, I know how he'll respond. It's based on the way that I've lived my life that in a nutshell, you can take my name and identify me. However, God's name is different. God's name is derived of his character. God's name is derived of the character that he has already established. We are not waiting for God to show us who he is so that we can know the value of his holy name. God has established his name, and his name is in the foundation of the character and the integrity of who he is as the holy creator. As many of you know through scripture, there are name, many names whereby, whereby God is, is called. There are many names that God has. Each, each represents a different portion of his character. Each represents a different portion of our relationship with him. A few of them are these. There's Elohim, means the creator. Abba means father. Adonai means Lord, master. El Elyon means the God most high. El Roy means the God who sees. El Shaddai is God almighty. Jehovah Jireh is the Lord our provider. Jehovah Mkadesh means the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Rapha is the Lord our healer. Jehovah Sidkenu means the Lord our righteousness. Jesus means the Lord who saves. These are beautiful names of our God. These are roles that he fulfills. These are character qualities he possesses. These are attributes of our relationship with him. This is how we identify our God. Yet these are not his name. These are not the identifying name of the Lord Jesus Christ, of our God, of our Heavenly Father. You see, just as I, Caleb, have roles that I fulfill and names that I possess, I possess daddy, I possess husband, I possess pastor, I possess coach. There are names that I receive that people, I call me and they say my name and I respond to them. Yet that is not my name. I have different nicknames that I've received over the time of my life. Some of them I have no clue and I don't even understand them. My dad, when I was growing up, he would call me Hoss. Hoss, I think, comes from an old Western show of a, of a, of a guy who just works really hard and just a, a rough and tough and tumble guy. I think that's where it comes from. I'm really not sure. I had a friend in high school. He called me. He called me Uncle Rico. Uncle Rico, uh, it's when, when in my high school my hair would get long and my hair gets really poofy when it gets long. And so he called me Uncle Rico because it reminded him of Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> when his Uncle Rico had a really big poofy bowl cut and so he would call me <laughs> Uncle Rico and that was just my name forever. My brother, I do not know why, he calls me Super Jim. I have no clue where it came from, but all of a sudden one day he called me Super Jim, and that was my nickname for the rest of my life, I guess. But we received nicknames, and those are not my name. There are attributes or character qualities that someone might use to describe you or I. It might be someone who might call you trustworthy. They might call you honest. They might call you responsible. They might call you spiritual. But that's not your name. God's name comes from Exodus 3, verse 13 and 15. If you'll read verse 13 with me. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. They shall say unto me, What is thy name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. In verse 15, he says, And God moreover said to Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord thy God of, of, of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. God's name is I am. The understanding of the word I am, his name is Yahweh. God's name, his official, his primary, his supreme identifying name is Yahweh. That is the holy name that we just sang about a moment ago. 
the holy name that is holy forever. That is Yahweh that we get to define and to express our love to our Savior. Yahweh means to be the self-existent one. In the Hebrew language, there are no vowels. And so as they spell the name Yahweh, it is spelled Y-H-W-H. Similar to uh, uh, like an English word might be rhythm. I know sometimes English teachers, if you're out there, I know the Y is supposed to sometimes be an I. It's not. Okay, But that's as close as we can get in our English language. A, a, a word that has no letters, that's how the, the Hebrew language is, is, is set up and, and, is, and is constructed. And Yahweh is spelled with a Yod, a He, a Wa, and an He. H, Y-H-W-H. The English word that we use for uh, Yahweh is Jehovah. As we just read off those names of Christ, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Tzidkenu, Jehovah uh, Nisi. These are the names from, for Yahweh. And it anchors us to who he is. It is the personal covenant name of the God of Israel. Yahweh is such an intensely sacred name to the Jewish scribes that they would say that they should not even speak the name of Yahweh. And so as they would describe and as they would be speaking before, instead of saying Yahweh, they would say Hashem. Hashem is to say the name. Rather than actually saying his name, they would say the name as a reference to Yahweh so that they could keep his name, his identifying and supreme name as holy and sacred and reverent as possible. During the time that they would be writing, the scribes would take time and they would, they would take special precautions when they wrote the name Yahweh using a different uh, uh, article to write with, taking time and, and praying before they wrote it, taking time to wash and cleanse themselves before they wrote the name Yahweh because it is sacred, because it is God's identifying name. Some rabbis even taught this, that you could not, uh, the, the name Yahweh could not be pronounced in the same way that we would understand pronouncing a word. Yet instead, Yahweh would simply be more of a breath, that the Y-H would be the inhale and the W-H would be the exhale. Which when you understand that, it gives so much more perspective to the moment in Genesis 1 as he says, into the nostrils of man breathed the breath of life. That God is life. And through his name Yahweh, he gave life through his breath into man and made us living soul. God's name as Yahweh is magnificent and is beautiful. And I want to make a connection here in this moment from the name Yahweh into the next segment of sermons that we'll enjoy. The seven I am statements of Jesus. Here in Exodus, he describes, God describes himself as I am, as Yahweh. Later in the New Testament, as we'll see, God makes seven statements, I am. And he makes claim, and he makes claim as he is God, the God who is going to save the world from their sins. Jesus is God. The God of Israel's name is, uh, is, uh, is, is Yahweh. And the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. God the Father is God the Son, is God the Holy Spirit. John, 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. We serve a triune God. He is a trinity. He is one God in three distinct persons. John 1 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. This same was in the beginning with God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Yahweh's name is the name of God. And Jesus, as he came to this earth, he came in the flesh to relieve us and to uh, uh, provide reconciliation from our sin. Matthew 1, 21 says, And he shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This name that Jesus carries is the Jesus means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves. 
You see, as Jesus came to this earth and as he began to make the seven I am statements that we were going to look at in, in, in the upcoming weeks, it is these statements where Jesus is making a statement about himself and the deity that he carried with all the authority of his heavenly father, Yahweh. With all power of Yahweh. I want to talk about the name Yahweh today. I'm going to make six implications of this name. We're going to go through them quickly. Yahweh is self-sufficient. Your God, the God that you serve, is self-sufficient. Self-existent. That's the definition of what Yahweh means. It means self-existent one. Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, and ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. John 8 says, Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. God is self-existent. I wanted to read this for you because I could never have said it any better than this. God is the uncaused cause. He is the uncreated creator. He is the source of all things, the one who has originated everything and who sustains everything that exists. He is the one in whom all things find their source. They find their existence and find their continuance. He is the ever-present power that sustains all life. There is no other source of life and none other like him. His existence is different than other existence. He is the beginning of all other existence. Isaiah tells us that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. He is independent in the unconditioned existence. It is from his existence that all other existence is derived. He is self-existent. He is Yahweh. He is the impossible that has entered into our life. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians tells us, And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Revelation tells us, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Acts tells us, For in Him we live and move and have our being. Yahweh is self-existent, and without Him we would be nothing and we are nothing. Yet in Him we can have life eternal, because He is the eternal one. There's never been a time when God did not exist, and then there will never be a time when God ceases to exist. Everything in our world, everything we understand, has an expiration date and has a time limit, even time itself. Revelation 10 says, and, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that it therein are, and the, thi- and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. There is a moment at which time began and God was before. There is a moment that time will end and God conti- will continue to be. God is, Yahweh is, self-existent. He is the first cause. He is the great I am. He is Yahweh. Yahweh is self-existent, but also Yahweh is impeccable. Yahweh is impeccable. Impeccable means to be without fault, to be without error, to be without sin. Our God is sinless and he is perfect. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Yahweh is perfect. Yahweh is holy. Holy forever, as the song we just sang described to us. Without that perfection, we would be lost. Without that holiness and that majestic perfection that he carries in his character, we would be lost still. 
But it is because God is impeccable. It is because he is without sin that he has provided life to us. He is the singular potentate. A potentate is a ruler, a sovereign, one who wields power or sway. Paul calls God the only potentate. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, in our world, there are kings. In the time of Paul, there were kings and people who would rule over the, the nations and over the regions and people who had power and had sway. They had the authority of kingship. Yet there is only one king that will reign supreme. There is only one king that will surpass time. There is only one king that can offer you redemption from your sin. There is only one king that will outlast time itself, and that is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The scripture calls him the only wise God. Yet there is wisdom in this world. There are wise men. There are the angels who are wise. There is the devil who tricks us and and, and beguiles us every day. There are those far wiser than we are, yet there is only one God by comparison, only one that is truly wise. 1 Timothy says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the God only wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's impeccable. He's sinless. The scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It is because Yahweh is impeccable, is sinless, is perfect, is holy, that is able to pass that righteousness onto you if you place your faith in him. He's he's perfect. Yahweh is impeccable, but also, thirdly, Yahweh is incomprehensible. Incomprehensible. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. There is no way that we could search out our Yahweh. There's no way we can understand him. And I, for one, am thankful for it. If I could understand God, then I could, I, could, uh, I could try to, in my own way, become like him. I could try in my own way to do his job for him. But he is so far outside our ability to search out. He is so far wiser. He is so far more powerful. He is so far more in, uh, impeccable and perfect than we could ever understand. And that is valuable for us. We cannot grasp the depths of his wisdom. We cannot fathom the vastness of his power. We cannot comprehend the integrity of his character. And that is what makes him God. The scripture tells us in Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It is impossible for us to try to understand and to grasp and to wrap our mind around God. We don't understand life without time. We don't understand life without limitations. We don't know what it means to be perfect and to be sinless. We cannot fathom who he is and how he is who he is. Our God is incomprehensible. And that's what makes him God. Fourthly, Yahweh is supreme. Yahweh is supreme. There is none other like our God. You see, we use names to distinguish something from something of its like kind. As we talk about dogs, we talk about a bulldog and a, and a pit bull, and we talk about a, a chihuahua, and we, we ha- it's all in the category of, of dog. Yet there are different names that we use to identify and to differentiate between the dogs. God's name is not that way. Yahweh is not a description of who God is in an attempt to try to differentiate him from the other gods of this world. Yahweh is not an attempt to identify him apart from the God of humanism, apart from the God of lust, apart from the God of materialism. It is not an identifier so that we could parse him out amongst the gods. 
Yahweh is a name that is a declaration that there is only one God. Yahweh is the name that defines the one and only true God. He alone is supreme in his power. He alone is absolute in his authority. And he alone is transcendent to life. You and I can find help in no other. We can give no other credence to any other God that can provide for us what only Yahweh can provide for us. He is supreme. There are no other gods but God alone. He is the only God. This comes through in the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, as Jesus, as God begins to give his uh, Ten Commandments. He says, there shall have no other God before me. Because idols are nothing. The idols that we have are just a creation of the created. Yet God is the creator. We can form and fashion creation, uh, idols for ourselves. We can take our focus off of Yahweh and we can put it onto the things of this world. We can put it on the things that we desire. We can put it onto uh, 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 images that, that we've made or a life, a vision of a life that we try to create for ourselves. But it is simply, at the end of the day, an idol. Something that can do nothing for us. God is the only true God. 1 Corinthians 8 tells us, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. We would do well today if we would set our eyes back on the one and true God, Yahweh, to confess the adultery of our heart, as we have placed other things in His place, God will not share the throne of your heart. We must give Him the the, the, the respect, the reverence that is due His holiness as the one true God, Yahweh. He reigns supreme. Fifthly, Yahweh is immutable. Immutable means unchanging. This is unchanging. These unchanging characteristics have to do with his character. We know throughout Scripture that God is willing to make changes. Remember back when Abraham, or when God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And as he was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham comes knowing that his left nephew lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham came to God and began to pray on the behalf of his nephew. And he said, God, if there's 50 righteous in Sodom, would you please spare it from destruction? God said, yes. He made a change. Abraham continues to pray, if there's 45, if there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 20, if there's 10, will you spare Sodom and Gomorrah? And God said, yes. God is willing to make changes. We know that uh, when, when God was coming down from, or no, when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai after having met with God and received the Ten Commandments in his hand, he came down and he began to see the children of Israel down in the valley as they were worshiping the golden calf. God told Moses, get behind me, I am going to destroy them. As Moses began to pray and to talk with with God, he said, God, please spare them. The Bible tells us that God changed his mind about destroying the people and instead went through and fulfilled the promise of leading them to the promised land. God's willing to change. God's willing to make adjustments in his great perfect plan. However, the thing that does not change, the thing that makes God immutable is his unchanging character. The integrity of who our God is, of who Yahweh is, will never change. The scripture tells us in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi tells us, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. James 1.17 says, every good gift and perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is so faithful. 
God is so consistent. He is unchanging in the character of who he is. You can know that if you live today or if you were to have lived a hundred years ago or a hundred years from now, you can know that no matter what happens in our political world, that you have an opportunity to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That your children, no matter what kind of the world they grow up in, have an opportunity to come to the one who never changes and to find repentance for their sin and to have an eternity that is secure because he never changes. There's an old hymn says, great is thy faithfulness. It was written by Thomas O. Chrisholm in 1923. I want to read the lyrics for you. It talks about the faithfulness and the unchanging nature of our God. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature and manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Yahweh is immutable, unchanging in the character of who he is. And number six, I want to share with you, Yahweh is omnipotent. Omnipotent means to be all-powerful. To be all-power, to have power, to do anything he desires to do. Yahweh can do anything. Matthew 19 tells us that Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Job understood this as he reads, I know that thou canst do everything. And that no thought can be withholden from me. This aspect of God really just grips my heart and my mind. To recognize that God is omniscient means he knows everything. And to understand that he is omnipotent means he can do anything. And when I combine the fact that God knows everything there is to know about me, every failure, every fault, every sin, every inadequacy that I hold in my life, and he understands it and he knows it, And he couples that with the power to do anything he decides to do. In the justness that he carries in his character, he can treat me how he would want to treat me. And how I deserve to be treated because of the sin that's in my life and my heart. And yet, he desires to love me. And yet, he desires to care about me. And yet, he desires to have a relationship with me. I find myself in the words of... Psalm 8, verse 3 and 4, says, When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Why would God care about me? Why would God care about you? He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He has all power could have wiped us off, off the face of the earth. And he almost did, back with Noah and the flood. But through his graciousness and his love, he gave mankind another chance. He gave you an opportunity to see and to understand his love and his grace, his unchanging character. He gave you a chance to meet Yahweh. Our God is omnipotent. He proved his power through creation. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Genesis 1 uh, tells us, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. I have a hard enough time telling myself what to do in accomplishing that. But God, with one word, with one statement, with the breath of his mouth, can create the universe. 
He's omnipotent. Our God is all-powerful and omnipotent through salvation. Revelation 19 says, After these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. The only one that can grant you eternity is the one who is eternal. The only one that can give you power over death is the one through his own, who through his own power has conquered death. That is Yahweh. That is the omnipotent Yahweh that you serve. As we close this morning, I want to encourage you and I want to remind you and I want to make a declarative statement that there is only one God. And his name is Yahweh. He gave himself to save you from your sin and he invites you into a daily and a personal relationship with him. If you have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, if you have never placed your faith in Yahweh, the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day for salvation. Don't leave today not having a relationship and not placing your faith in Yahweh. We spoke about it a moment ago. There is no other God beside him. There is no other hope beside him. There is no other eternity beside him. And if you are not willing to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to have your faith rest in Yahweh, then he cannot grant you the eternity in his presence, but he will grant you an eternity apart from his presence. And he does not desire for you to spend an eternity apart from him. He desires you to be with him. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Yahweh wants a relationship with you if you will place your faith in him. If you're here today and you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a faith that is anchored in the one true God in Yahweh, I want to encourage you to strengthen your faith in your God today. To remind yourself that He is self-existent. He is immutable. He is incomprehensible. He is supreme. He is impeccable. He is omnipotent. That your God is unlike any other. He is the uncreated creator, the unmoved mover, the first cause. He is the great I am. He is Yahweh. I hope that this message was a spiritual encouragement to you today. If you made a decision for Christ today, we would love to hear about it. And you can contact our church at 419-866-0773 or email us at info at monclovabaptist.org. Either way, let us know what God is doing in your life. And I look forward to seeing you next week right here at Monclova Road Baptist Church.